this is from um, the first chapter, so the chapter immediately following the prologue, and this passage is describing a ritual that uh, Alcestis and her sister Hippothoe, who is her most loved sister, um, perform near the beginning of the novel to honor their grandfather Poseidon. So it, it shows a little bit, I think, of what kinds of interactions she has with the gods in the early part of the novel, before she really gets into this situation of having gods uh, meddling quite directly mm -hmm. in her life. So. The two-handled vessel sat by the round hearth, where Hippothoe had placed it on the first day of the new year, after the slaves brought it up from the shore. We girls were forbidden to walk into the water, even for ritual purposes. The seaweed circling the vessel's base had stained the clay white. Hippothoe knelt before the jar, picking the seaweed away and passing it to me as she whispered thanks to the local gods of the shore for giving us their harvest. I wound the crackling black-green strands into a loose coronet and placed it ceremoniously on her bent head. She made a little ugh face. We both preferred the laurel garlands of Apollo to our grandfather's brackish crowns. Most of the seawater in the jar had disappeared into the air, but some still sloshed in the bottom. It smelled like Eolcus concentrated, salt and fish and stagnation. We hefted the vessel between us, but it wobbled as I flexed my pinched fingers, spattering water onto the stone floor. Hippothoe shot me a dark look. The seawater was a gift, and if Peleus saw it slop, but he hadn't, he wasn't there. We hobbled out through the entrance hall and the open doors to the porch, and slaves bustled around us as we put down the vessel. One of the kitchen boys brought out a mallet and set it beside Hippothoe, bowing as its head clunked on the floor. She smiled up at him. The rest of the porch was empty, which was only right for it was our territory in this warm season. Here we sat in nice weather, spinning wools, letting the gods, excuse me, letting the wind gods stroke our faces. The work of spinning heated the calluses on my fingers and cramped my hands, but on the porch we could whisper to each other without distracting the men inside the hall, without being shouted at for our noisiness or dragged back to our bedchamber by our furious father. If it though we knelt again, facing the sea in the jar, she motioned to me to fix my hair and held her hand out for mine. The creases of her palms sparkled with sweat. I swept hair out of my eyes, knelt, and gripped her hand, my head bent for prayer. Earthshaker, sea controller, grandfather, she said, her voice still scratchy. We ask your protection this year for the house of Tyro's children. For years you have given it in recognition of your love, and for years we have repaid your protection with honor, for you are mighty and just, grandfather, and we know it well. While she spoke, I studied the black painting on the sides of the jar the warriors crouching there, their wedge-shaped beards. They had frightened me when I was younger, but the god my grandfather frightened me more. I imagined him grappling with my faded grandmother on the sands and was struck with a giddy terror that made me sink my teeth into my lip. If I laughed and Peleus heard me, or if Poseidon did... Hippothoe continued, We ask your care for the house of Iolcus, for Peleus and Peleus' children. Poseidon, grandfather, accept this vessel we have made for you to show how we honor your love. We offer you fealty, lord. For the house of Iolcus, I, Hippothoe, granddaughter of Tyro, second youngest, blessed by your hand, do consecrate this vessel to you. She let go of my hand, pulled the crown of seaweed from her head, and pushed it through the mouth of the jar, then looked up almost instinctively towards the walls and the shore beyond. We drew breath at the same moment and held it, waiting, our chests full of uncertainty. Would he come? Would he be kind to us if he did? Would Peleus be pleased to see his father? Would I be pleased? I had only seen my grandfather once that I remembered, though Paisidice said he'd come to the palace after my birth. He had come, too, for Acastus's growth day ritual. He had been great and fearsome, more fearsome than my father, and he'd left his trident humming in the corner of the great hall all day. Ever since, the stones in that corner had been swollen and crusted with salt. The kitchen slaves would scrape it off sometimes, those who dared to touch it, but it still crept back, glittery white. Mostly I remembered Poseidon's thick, sea-clogged smell and the way his black hair lay dull and damp against his skull, and the pattern of drips he'd left on the floors, like stories marked out in the stars. I didn't expect him to appear now. There was a reason the words of the prayer contained no specific invitation. But he might. He always might come, always might be submerged off store, circled with nereids, waiting to burst from the surf, or to drag down some girl careless enough to edge her toes into the water. <laughs> 